started. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, 2021 Esports Symposium. My name is Dennis Large, and I'm the director of the Educational Technology Services Unit here at Riverside County Office of Education. Um, and I can tell you that our whole team is excited uh, that you're here, that you're joining us for this event. Um, I can also tell you that uh, our involvement in esports has uh, really touched my heart. You know, we've uh, visited campuses with esports clubs, and we've seen the engagement. Um, when students become engaged, then that's when they become scholars. That's when they build skills that will lead them to success in college and in careers. In fact, just this week, we visited Paloma Valley High School in the Paris Union uh, uh, High School District. And uh, the mix of students uh, in that club was as diverse as any of it I've ever seen. And I asked them one question, and that was, what are you getting out of being involved in, uh, in, in esports? And um, it, it, you know, if you think about that for a second and, and try and guess what their main answer was, I'll, I'll tell you in just a second. So I asked them, what are you getting out of being involved in esports club? Their answers were friends, community, family. They were literally calling each other their brothers and sisters. Uh, uh, it was just, uh, um, it, 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 it kind of melted all of us right, right there. It was uh, just a beautiful thing. Um, uh, let me do a, uh, a one more quick welcome for you. I'd like to introduce our Chief Academic Officer here at the Riverside County Office of Education and my boss. Uh, Amanda Corden. Amanda? Thank you, Dennis. Uh, welcome everyone to the second annual eSports Symposium. Uh, we're happy to have you here. I can speak from experience and uh, telling you that our COE is second to none in the support that they give districts to the eSports initiative. Um, I was a, an employee in a neighboring school district when I attended a conference in which our COE was presenting on their esports. And I can't, uh, to this day, I, I can't stop telling people how excited I got. It just lit a fire in me and worked with some people in our district to kind of roll out esports. And I think the biggest benefit, in my opinion, is just the ability to reach a whole nother set of, of students that weren't, um, may not have been as engaged in school, were now just excited to come, excited to participate in something that they were interested in, that they saw value in. And so it just, it just warmed my heart. And like I said, our COE, this team is second to none in what you're gonna hear today and the support that they're gonna give you if you're interested in initiating esports within your district, um, I can honestly say that the team right here will be with you every step of the way. So again, welcome, enjoy your time today and um, enjoy. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Um, our, our team truly appreciates your support. Well, uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Steve Hickman. Uh, many of you already know Steve. Uh, he runs, he leads our esports initiatives, including um, working with districts on, on developing clubs and teams, uh, running tournaments, um, uh, giving out scholarships, uh, and this symposium. So, Steve, kick us off. I think you're muted, Dr. Hickman. Well, well thank you, Dennis, and thank you, Ms. Corden, for. Uh, for, for really supporting uh, this effort. It's, it's been um, really a joy actually to, to participate in. And uh, I also want to take a minute and just to uh, thank our symposium, our symposium sponsors, DGI, APC, and Aruba. Uh, you can find out more information about those sponsors in uh, the SCAD under the sponsors link. And uh, you can find some contact information uh, for them as well. We'd also like to thank our our esports league sponsors, uh, ViewSonic, who's our, our partner with this, as well as uh, the Riverside County Office Teachers Association, uh, Saboba Foundation, Hijinx Java, the Core Collaborative, and Innovation High at Alta Vista. And of course, uh, we couldn't do what we do without the support of the RCOE Foundation, who really helps to facilitate our, our scholarship program and, uh, you know, we have the, op the options through our program to give scholarships to those schools of, of who win tournaments, and they are the ones that are facilitating that. So we're truly appreciative of them 
And we want to encourage you to support them in other ways because we offer scholarships not only through esports, but through various uh, uh, programs throughout the county. And if you do have the opportunity, please take a moment to uh, share the great things that you hear in the symposium with our hashtag esports symposium or RCOE esports. Um, share. Um, and uh, encourage others to join and, and be a part of this community because that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to build a community where people are, are enthusiastic about esports and recognize the value of esports. And um, I think this is a great opportunity and a great start for us to do that. And just a couple of reminders about uh, SCED. We're using SCED to coordinate the, uh, the various sessions. And so if you, want to attend a session or see the schedule of sessions. If you're here, you probably already found that out, but uh, the bit.ly ES21 SCED, all lowercase, will take you directly to uh, the eSports uh, schedule. Uh, and each session has a unique Zoom link. And of course, if you want to attend any of those sessions, you do need to be logged into SCED and you'll see that big yellow button there that says open SCED and that will take you directly to your session. And at the conclusion of each session, please take a moment to, to give some feedback uh, to the presenters to help us to um, you know, further plan our, our future symposium events. And don't worry if you miss something, if you miss uh, a session because maybe there are two that you wanted to see, uh, we are recording these sessions so that um, we can post them uh, the sessions for this year, as well as the sessions for last year, so that you can get a truly complete picture of the uh, esports um, symposiums that we've conducted so far. And now, I would like to spend a moment here. Give me a second. I would like to introduce our keynote speaker. Now, I could tell you about her, her impressive, really, curriculum vitae. I, I, I might be able to describe the volumes of scholarly work that she has produced or, or collaborated upon on the topic of games and learning. <laughs> I can tell you that if the scholarly universe of games and learning had a power couple then she and her partner, Dr. Kurt Squire, would be that couple. Instead, I want to share something with you that you can't Google. I want to tell you about one moment, one moment in time. Sorry, Whitney. Um, when a young, well, not so young graduate student heard this professor speak at what was likely his first academic conference. You know, he watched attentively as she demonstrated very concisely and coherently that some children are able to understand the written word better in the context of a game than in the context of a classroom. You know, she also suggested a very likely reason why this was so. And you know, that, that resonated with me, but, but I'll be honest, you know, I soon forgot about it. You know, the answer was so simple. You know, at that point in my life, I could not fully appreciate the fecundity, the, the fruitfulness of that idea. I had a program to finish at Pepperdine University. You know, I got the opportunity to work here at the Riverside County Office of Education. I have, I have the opportunity to help facilitate an esports league for the 430,000 students of Riverside County. And I know how hard I had to work to have this opportunity. And now, along with an amazing team, Dr. Dennis Large, Heidi Baines, Nancy Delgado, Mike Leffen, who couldn't be here, and Casey McCall, who couldn't be here. We asked this respected scholar 
to deliver a keynote address because we believe she can share something that will resonate with you. I know because she's done it before. A scholar who was at the forefront of online games and learning long before scholastic esports was a thing, right? A person who has dedicated herself to understanding the cognitive, socio-emotional, and motivational relationships between games and learning. One who inspires us as learners and educators, and, and God forbid we ever cease to be learners, to apply some of the principles of those relationships to our own pedagogy and learning environments. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor. I am proud to present to you, well, the Beyonce of scholarly games and learning universe, Dr. Constance Steinkuhler. Thank you. Oh, unmute. Thank you. I, I just want to say thank you, Dr. Hickman. I don't know how to follow that introduction, but as a massive fan of Beyonce, all I can say is I could only dream to one day be the Beyonce of video games. Um, I am so glad to be here. Uh, I know we spend a lot of time on Zoom, but it, it's really an honor just to connect to other parents and educators in this space in our in our local area. Um, I'll tell you right now, I've been doing games for a long time, um, and I didn't come to games because I was a gamer. I came to games because kids brought me there. I'm very interested in youth. I'm particularly interested in teenagers, um, and I now have two of my own. They're now middle and high schoolers, um, but I really came to games out of an interest of what kids were into and what they were doing outside of school, and specifically how in the world we can actually make school relevant again. Um, if you're busy and if you're, if you're multitasking, I'll just tell you right now um, what my big point is. I will say I've built game programs, games for education, done all this work in games and education. The eSports space is probably one of the most impactful spaces to engage kids in learning that I've ever seen so far. And it is overwhelmingly because of the mentors that you were able to put into the game space with kids. The role of, so esports as a competitive video game play really is a structure. And that structure enables us to have more knowledgeable coaches and general managers and teachers and supporters in that space. And it's really the only natural kind of naturalistic space in which you can do that. And because of that, esports is this very, um, it's one of the most effective spaces I've seen to try to think about games as a vehicle for learning. So that's my big point. Um, if that's all you need, there you go. Um, but hopefully I'm going to walk through a little bit of data and not bore you too much to kind of prove it to you. Because if you're a parent and an educator like me, you probably have ambivalence around games. And I'm here to say that I have ambivalence around games too. Um, you know, games are good for some things in some contexts with some kids. They are not good across the board carte blanche. And frankly, right now, the games industry needs the, I mean, I guess what my grandmother would say is a good, you know, swift kick in the back end because of some of their practices around exclusionary tactics, around, you know, sort of this old boys network and club. There's a lot of problems I have with games as an industry, but games as a medium are really powerful. There's a reason that we talk about addiction to games and not addiction to books. So for me, um, turning that kind of stickiness, that kind of engagement into something productive is my life's work and it matters to me. Um, so hopefully I can, maybe I can hopefully get it to matter for you as well. So let me dive in. Um, so as I said, I study cognition and learning in video games. I'm trained to be in education and studying, um, studying how kids think and learn. I'm particularly interested in teens and young adults. I came to games and esports in particular, games a long time ago, but esports for me, I had always sort of seen as kind of an outside niche kind of um, activity. I'm a big fan of games out of Korea and Korea is just the mothership for competitive gaming. So I had been to plenty of esports um, communities, et cetera, but only until I got here at UCI did I realize how 
esports have become a mainstay part of forward leaning campuses so that now you have I mean it's over 70 programs that have full ride scholarships to college for competitive gameplay, which is extraordinary. And I'm right now at UCI in Irvine, University of California, Irvine. And we have not only a championship team, but we have an extraordinary program that has been run by a young man named Mark Deppi, who, um, you know, what we do in our program is far more than just compete. Uh, they have a lively community. We do bystander training to actually teach young people how to be impact, how to be agents for change online but I don't wanna to digress too much in how much I love our esports program. It's really what got me interested in paying attention to what was happening in esports here in the States. So one of the first things my team and I did was sort of think about like, what is this esports, what is the esports ecosystem? We have professional level esports, collegiate level esports, and we spent a good year looking around in LA. We went up to, to we actually went to Korea for a bit studying the team that we have here, talking to other teams and other players and other campuses and putting together kind of a model, trying to understand what were the roles inside esports, right? And of course, I'm using my own educator's mind when I think about this ecosystem. You know, it's not merely a matter of just the teams that are here sort of at the center. We always focus on the teams that are on stage, but behind the team on stage, are dozens and dozens of experts that actually enable that gameplay to happen. Everything from coaches and data analysts over to shoutcasters and streamers, down to all of the sort of corporate sponsorship, web development, marketing and business, all the way over to events, organizing, general managers, et cetera. So there is a lot of diversity in the level of professional roles and even on college campuses in terms of the esports ecosystem. But of course, I care about education. So for me, one of the main things that was so provocative for me was that so many of these roles can be tied directly to, to standards, K through 12 standards that we value in school. So we started thinking about how could we build a youth program that would take this love of esports and make it something that would connect kids to school. Not because I wanna colonize their play spaces, I don't. And I think we have to be really careful to not um, come in overly heavy handed and sort of colonize and chase kids out of the space by, by um, you know, adding structures that don't feel naturalistic and authentic. Instead, what I'm so interested in is how do we actually prove to kids that school and the substance and content that we teach in school is relevant, is relevant for more than just passing tests. Um, overwhelmingly data is now showing us, and it's been this way for almost a decade now, that even the kids who are doing well in school see school as nothing but credentialing. For all of us in education and for parents too, this is heartbreaking, right? The idea that somehow schools have become this regime of testing and sorting kids instead of something that really deeply connects their interests to their future selves is a problem. So what's so provocative in an esports space is that given that you have these naturalistic um, sort of connections between the K through 12 standards and the various roles in esports, the whole question that we landed on was how could we take these standards, next gen science standards, the common core ELA standards, CTE, social emotional learning, the full gamut, and how can we connect it up to what kids are doing in esports? So can we formalize it? So a couple years ago, um, let's see, that was about four and a half years ago, we put together a pilot program here in California, um, and we decided to try to see how we might connect these two. Now, you know, as Dr. Hickman um, discussed, there's a really deep body of literature about when, how, and for whom video games are important mechanisms for learning. If you think of games as simulations, um, it becomes a little bit more obvious and intuitive about how that may come about. But it turns out that indeed, I did not even know this until I dug into it, that sports actually has a really important role to play in schools. Now, 
as a professor, I can tell you many professors like me don't know a lot about the role that that athletics play. Um, so it was very surprising um, to find out that in fact, sports develop these very positive relationships with caring adults at school. They certainly help cultivate this mastery learning orientation, this internal locus of attribution, which is to say that helping kids understand that success is not some sort of you know, uh, is not the consequence of like a God-given talent. Success is actually from the effort and the training that you put into it. That is an incredibly crucial, think about Dweck's work. It's a really incredibly crucial sort of framework to bring. And sports does all of this work for kids to tether them to school, to have them feel connected, to build relationships, but also to sort of give them a frame, a, a sort of framework for thinking about performance and ability in a very productive way. Well, esports is just this combination between games and sports, right? So it seems like there's certainly a plausibility argument for why one might try to make it not a sort of a scholastic version of esports. So we put together this great partnership. Um, Samueli Foundation was absolutely crucial in running this. Gerald Solomon, huge shout out to him for helping us organize this entire partnership. But we decided to launch this pilot program called NASA. This is the North America Scholastic Esports Federation, which is a huge mouthful. We just call it NACEF. Um, and certainly we're seeing all sorts of other kinds of programs pop up in similar ways. NACEF though now has partnered with multiple different leagues, which I'm very proud to say, I think it's a great way to scale. But in this first iteration, we really just focused on esports with a mission. And the idea was that esports would be a platform for communication, for STEM learning, for social emotional development, et cetera. So we put together a program. The really key sort of components in my view are the fact that this is based on a club model and not just a league model. So the league, you know, every season of the league changes titles, what game play, what game they choose to play. And all the kids typically play the same title, but not all the kids are good enough to be on the competitive team. That does not mean that they don't participate, right? That team is typically fluid. And we really focus on the club aspect, meaning that it's student led, student driven, and it's the students that actually do work like raise money for jerseys or create a website for their team. So there's a lot of work that happens that is not merely playing the game itself, right? Um, two other points I'll point out is that we always have a teacher who's a general manager who is the liaison for school. These are clubs run in after school programs. And second, you know, we try to always have a coach. And sometimes that coach is someone outside that you can hire or get through connected camps or the programs. But typically having a coach is really vital. Um, the coaches that we've used in the past were through connected camps. And these are college students, often first gen college students, um, often STEM majors, but not always. Um, but students who um, we actually vetted and trained to work with youth. So it's really, um, as I said at the very beginning, one of the most important things about esports is that you have this opportunity for adults and mentors to be gaming cheek to jowl with kids so that when some crisis comes up, an argument or say some misunderstanding or an epic fail in the game, that mentor is right there with them and has the respect of students because they're already a, a superior, excellent gamer. But because they have that sort of respect and they play with kids, they are there to actually intervene and help point them to resources that connect them to academic work, but also to help them think through what is a good way to be a good citizen online. They're there to say things like, hey, bud, you know, when you scream those things at your teammate, you not only ruin your own gameplay, but you blow the entire team up. So your own sort of self-regulation of emotion has a direct consequence on whether or not the team does well. And it has been totally surprising how much students really valued this level of sort of social and emotional work and how for many of them, it's the first time they've ever had a coaching experience where a caring mentor told them how to be a better team person, how to be a better team member, how to be a better citizen online, which for us was very surprising. But let me dig a bit into that. 
So we based this on research. We also conducted research as we went through. So part of my team role, my, my sort of my research team at the university has been um, really trying to understand, are we making good on the goals of the program, but also understand like, um, how are we doing that and what can we dial up? So that's been our role. And I'm gonna talk a bit about that research. When we first started, we just chose six schools at random. Um, we really went for as, as much of a diverse set of schools as we could. And we just literally went in and watched kids play. We talked and interviewed teachers and we interviewed students and coaches and even some parents at our championship event, just to get a sense of, you know, is this mapping what we just created out as a formal program, you know, is it working? Um, did we, were we able to sort of keep those authentic, natural connections to academics without being too heavy handed? And the results were really interesting. Um, we took all of the qualitative data and we broke it out into units and coded it so we could quantify it with um, using literally straight um, standards from uh, NSTA, this is a, a overlap map, but sort of using standards to understand like what was popping in some of the data. And it was very interesting that first year, what we found is that here, yes, the blue is STEM. So yes, you do see some STEM work. Oftentimes it's around data and trying to define problems and answer problems with data. We saw math work, of course, because, you know, games are simulations and they're digital. So they crank out a lot of numbers that tell you how the team did. So certainly we saw some math and we also saw some English language arts around um, argumentation, understanding how to use evidence to, to support your claim and communication. But look at these huge jumps over here. You know, we had just added social emotional because we thought, well, teams work, you know, teamwork, they're going to need to, um, you know, it's another way in which we can connect it. And it turned out that uh, the CASEL model, which is a, a, just a, a generalized framework for social emotional learning, many of you probably are familiar with it. What we found was that that was the biggest um, outcome of that first year, which really got us to pay attention because what students and coaches and parents and teachers were telling us was that, yes, the academics were great, but this relationship and effective work was one of the more powerful interventions or one of the more powerful outcomes of the intervention. All right, so what did that look like? Well, when I talk about like, oh, students were doing STEM work, um, here's an example from a quote from an interview that would have been coded that way. And here in the blue, I'm just highlighting how this student is talking about how changing out champions, in this case, it was uh, League of Legends, how making some changes to the composition of the team, predicting what that would mean in terms of like the consequences of changing the system. Um, an example of social emotional learning. Here you have a student in the interviews talking about how typically they would get tilted very easily. And I'll talk about tilt later, but tilt is just um, basically when you have a really strong negative response to something and start making poor decisions, that's when you tilt. Um, and what you find is that they're saying, you know, the team really has helped them get off of tilt. Now they're able to regulate better and do a little bit more laughing and just focusing on their own gameplay. One more example, um, this student in the interview is talking about how, how important actually esports was to their relationship to school. Um, and this is a theme that comes up again and again. In fact, you see it not only in kids talking about their relationship to school, but many times we are also hearing um, in specifically young men talking about esports as something that has helped their relationship with their fathers. And oftentimes that's because their father, um, you know, may not have grown up on games, but grew up understanding traditional sports. And so esports is this nice transition space where a lot of young men were talking about how now their father can sort of engage and understand what they're into more now that it's like a competitive league structure. But in this case, the student is saying, you know, um, esports, that's what I've always wanted in school. I always actually avoided e actual sports and everything because I hated the crowds, but this is where I feel like I can truly fit in. And I suspect across the various discussions at this event, you're going to hear this again and again. Um, you know, there is a slate of students, uh, some of whom are doing very well in school, who do not feel that they are 
I guess, don't feel that they're seen in school and don't feel that they have those relationships where what they love is welcomed. And to be honest, um, for many of us, it's because we see games as something that is orthogonal to learning or orthogonal to academic progress. And because of that presumption, and it's not always wrong, but because of that presumption getting applied so frequently, a lot of kids feel like if they're really into games, there's just no place for it at school and it's not um, that it's it's not welcomed or seen. Um, and so these clubs have had a really important role in, um, in, I guess, taking a demographic that feels kind of not seen, heard, or valued at school and treating them like they're valued. It's really, um, it's very compelling when you hear kids talk about just how much it means to them when, say, a, a victory uh, one night in a league match actually gets announced in the morning um, with the other um, uh, game results of other sports, uh, you know, it's really hard to explain sometimes just how much that means to a kid who otherwise is not recognized. It means the world. Um, so this first year, we were really um, surprised about what we were seeing. Um, first, yes, it did work, but then, you know, in terms of academic content, but then second, what was happening in terms of kids' affect felt really important to us. All right, so we asked ourselves the second year, you know, um, well, if we're gonna ask teachers and schools to support esports, we need to at least make sure that they are at least as good at um, connecting kids to school and being vehicles for learning and positive uh, consequences for kids as other programs that they have an option to, to study, to, um, to enroll in. You know, because just like any kid, if you're going to do this club, you really, you don't have time for others. So we did a comparison. We actually studied, um, I think it was, again, six schools, and we did matched pair comparison. So within each school, we um, did a survey this time, and we surveyed kids in NASAP and kids out of NASAP, and they were matched on gender, GPA, and within school. So we could control for any differences there and simply wanted to know, you know, is NASEP at least having equivalent more or less outcomes as other programs are having? And it turned out, yes. Um, first off, on all the quantitative measures, they were all overwhelmingly positive, all significant, except this one was not significant, STEM identity. Um, and emotional regulation is marked down. And you'll see in our data, it's interesting, as kids start to see just how unregulated they are, um, they start reporting that they are very poor at emotional regulation. It's a kind of a strange phenomenon in research we call it like you don't know what you don't know so once you start actually attuning people to a particular variable suddenly you'll see this plummet in their estimations of their ability because they've never actually noticed that perhaps they're not good at it so across the board we see overwhelmingly positive results um, and when we compared it to other programs that you know other club programs in the after school space um, not only were we faring as well as other programs, but we actually uh, were, were faring better on certain variables, certainly around um, some of the STEM work, relationships with adults uh, was one that popped out as well, and some 21st century skills around grit, perseverance, and critical thinking. So, um, I mean, I think, I think at different schools, you're going to see different patterns of variables, but the big upshot here was that um, engaging kids in esports in this way was not robbing them from valuable experiences that other clubs could provide and we couldn't. So it turns out, yes, you can do all of this work with games that kids love, which is good. It's very, is, is really positive. So then once we saw that, our next year, year three, we asked, well, um, let's try to see if we can get a bit more rigor on this. And we wanted to do some pre-post direct measures rather than student self-report. So we, you know, used our survey and we evolved it and did some work with it. Um, and really now we wanted to do before and after the league seasons to see what is the change across time in development. But of course, now pandemic hit us, so we had to halt early. I can tell you a little bit about what we did see. So we needed a sample of 350 and we only were able to get 82. So keep that in mind, that's a much 
it's a much smaller sample than we wanted. But given that sort of, you know, caveat on the sample, what you see again is overwhelmingly all positive and significant variables. Again, um, we have one that's not significant and all the other ones are. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, two. This one is actually not either. Um, so, you know, again, we're seeing the same consistent findings. And since we had to halt data collection due to pandemic, we decided to um, go back and take a little bit more just use our time to analyze the data that we had a bit deep, a little bit more deeply. So we went back to look at earlier data and what we started looking at was, well, we asked, well, could we start to think about what are the features of the program that might matter? Um, and we were able to pull out some variables and it turned out that there were two really important features that seemed to increase the odds for an individual student to have these sort of greater positive gains. And the first one was student leadership. The fact that students are the agents that have to set up the club, set everything up, organize the league, run the club, et cetera, really mattered in terms of outcomes. The more they're positioned as in the lead seat um, and in charge of running things, the more opportunity they had to learn. The second one was, of course, these mentors. So here's the data showing that, in fact, um, coaches and teachers as general managers had a dramatic positive impact on the learning outcomes for kids. We also looked to see just who, which students, coaches, and GMs, what were they actually talking about most? And this was a little interesting in that, you know, I've said again and again that this sort of social, emotional work and relationships were really an area that popped. Well, if you look down at what they're actually focused on, you see why the GMs and the coaches are both doing a lot of work around team building, around how students treat one another online in games. So it's not for naught, it's not a magical thing that happened. It's actually that um, the mentors in the program were overtly focused on these dynamics. We also checked equity because, um, you know, we should be running schools that don't simply privilege kids that are already privileged. And so we wanted to understand how are um, schools doing by income here? The best we could do was the proxy measure we use around um, you know, free lunch. So we looked at schools with 100% free lunch and schools that were high income based on high income was determined again by free lunch and zip code. And it turned out that in fact, there were differences by income, but they all favored the lower income schools. So, positive outcome there. Essentially, um, these programs tend to have even greater impact around the schools that or the um, students in schools that are lower income tax bases. Um, and again, here you see the specific variables that favored the low income schools, but you know, science, math, and SEL, again, we also looked at tilts. Now we got interested in tilt because though they were infrequent in some of our transcripts, what we saw was that there would be these moments where students would completely lose any sense of regulating their feelings because of a frustration in game. And we wanted to dial in here and think a little bit about what was happening in that these sort of moments of tilt. Now, tilt, of course, is a term from pinball days, you know, when you um, would play too hard with a machine and it would get disrupted and it would just go bonkers tilt and you couldn't play anymore. But it's now a term that's picked up in poker and elsewhere. In esports, this is what tilt looks like. It's not good. It's, um, you know, when we talk about negative uh, talk, when we talk about toxic behaviors online, um, you know, they can get very extreme. They get extreme as hate based language, um, racial epithets, sexist statements, death threats, swatting, doxing, all of it. So it can get very, very dark including among young kids. So that's part of why we wanted to sort of do a closer look at what was happening. So we uh, did a mixed method study. We went and interviewed players and some staff, we used the staff interviews to triangulate with our players. Here we had about a hundred uh, kids and players, eight staff, 95 players that we interviewed. And we just asked them some basic questions. What words do you associate with tilt? How do you define it? What gets you tilted? What, um, how do you respond to tilt? And then we also ask them, you know, is tilt malleable? Is tilt something that you can change? Trying to imagine that 
for kids who think that it's malleable, they may also believe then that it's something that they are responsible for and can actually impact and therefore control. So we did the interviews. We again uh, carved them up into units of analysis and coded them. Um, we had three researchers coding it. This was a paper recently published in CHI. Um, and here's what we found. First, tilt was what we thought. There's this emotional component and a behavioral component. So kids knew what it was and knew how to define it. When it came to what triggers tilt, what you find is that the most common triggers are not opponents, right? As you might think, it's actually your team. Typically it's around poor communication or when one person tilts, it tilts everyone else. But team was the number one reason people tilted. Self, so your own performance was number two. Opponents were way down in the almost non-existent category. Um, when we asked about responses, you find that yes, yeah, students actually overwhelmingly did try to have positive responses to tilt. So positive responses might be something like taking a deep breath and forcing yourself to smile, right? It turns out that actually triggers all sorts of downward, down sort of downward, down river effects that are positive for reducing anxiety and stress. They also would simply take a break from the game, a highly advisable response to tilt or stress, take a break, get offline. The, another one, of course, is what we call lumping. It's a term from business. This basically just means sort of you do nothing. You just take the lumps and keep moving forward. You just sort of let it go and move on. However, there was still 22% of negative responses to tilt. And as I said before, these can get alarmingly significantly negative. So 22%, one in five, that's still what I would consider a problem. Now, we also were interested in how do these variables relate? So we were hypothesizing that different tilt triggers would lead to different tilt responses and that your perception of whether or not tilt could be in your control or if it's changeable would actually impact how you respond to tilt, tilt, to tilt triggers. And both of those were confirmed. It turns out that indeed, um, you know, different tilt triggers do elicit different types of responses. When it is um, other people, overwhelmingly players, young players who are in esports leagues try to be more positive, their harshest responses were really for their own play behavior. So when, when they made a mistake, but also when they lost the game or caused the loss, they really do tend to um, savage themselves, uh, eviscerate themselves when, um, when they themselves have done something that they're disappointed in, which I think is actually problematic. Um, the other uh, relationship is also true. So tilt, whether or not you think tilt is malleable also shapes how you respond when it happens. Um, it turns out that for students who perceive tilt as malleable, that they could actually change it, Overwhelmingly, you see these high numbers um, in the positive lumping and exiting. So these are all positive kinds of good, effective responses. When you do not think it's malleable, in fact, you see this jump in negative responses. So, you know, young players understanding that tilt is something within their control, that it's a skill you can acquire to actually self-regulate is really crucial to tamping down these kind of um, hostile behaviors. Um, and that's really important. You know, we're doing um, some other projects around toxicity and extremism in online games, trying to help figure out ways to, to stop it. Um, and I will say that what you find there is that most of the, of the, um, of the toxicity you see in public game spaces is not from a handful of terrible, you know, terrible, terrible monsters out there. It's everyday garden variety toxicity of people treating each other poorly. And frankly, I would say it's not just gamers and young players that ought to be more attentive about this. It's all of us, right? All of us need to remember that other people online matter and that the way we treat them matters. Um, but I digress. So both of these hypothesized relationships actually work. Um, we actually then looked at how the all three variables, and now we see something really, um, really worth taking note of. So if you think about, you know, 
un under the conditions of students who believe that tilt is malleable and changeable, what you see is that you see this shift toward positive, as I said before. And where tilt, where players who think that tilt is fixed and not changeable, you see this jump in negative. But what's very interesting here and alarming actually is that believing that tilt is changeable and malleable helps you in how you respond to tilt in all cases except one. And that is when you yourself are the trigger. So in essence, what you're saying is that the belief that tilt is malleable does not do anything to help stop students from, um, from abusing themselves, from being really harsh to themselves when they themselves are, when they're disappointed with with their performance. Now, I wanna step back for a second and try to contextualize this. When you think about the level of stress that adults in America and elsewhere, but I'm just gonna stick with America for now. We are now in a place where people are working multiple jobs in their adult lives under incredible duress. When you look at school, that kind of what I would call a stress epidemic has been happening in high school and middle school over the last 10 years, but we're now seeing it as low as elementary school. So think for a minute about the level of stress that our kids are under and the fact that, that overwhelmingly kids report that school is really about credentialing and sorting them. And I want us to think about how like imagine that you are a kid today in classes, imagine your son or your daughter, your students, the fact that there is this much pressure on them to perform in school. And then they go off in their game spaces where it's their passion space where they love it. And they have just as much pressure on them there to perform. It's, it's really, uh, it's alarming. And what we need to do about this, I think, is more of a big cultural issue than um, I can actually address in this talk. But let me just say that when you start to look at um, the fact that kids are putting this much pressure on themselves to perform in school and out of school, even in game spaces, I think you start to see that there are ways in which we need to teach kids not just self-regulation, but also ways to treat themselves much more kindly, because I think that's another source, and this is me speculating, but I think that that's actually another source of why we're seeing so much toxicity online as well. Okay, so that's tilt. Now, the fourth year, we just finished our data collection in year four, and there's a lot of text on the screen. All we're doing is dialing up the rigor of our study. This year, we actually went after a four, um, kind of a complicated experimental design. You know, one of the, one of the strange things about education um, is that it's really, you know, educational research has a really bad reputation of not having results that generalize outside of context. So you have an intervention, it works in a classroom with master teachers, but then getting it to work and scale to all these other classes is very difficult to do. Um, and people will often say it's because, you know, research in these spaces is not good enough, it's not quality enough, and all of that is poppycock. It's not true at all. The truth is that, especially in this after school space, it is very hard to do um, very rigorous kinds of studies because kids self-select into the programs because they're interest-driven programs. And that self-selection creates a bias that you can't randomize out. And assigning kids to interest-driven programming does not make one whit of sense. So it's always kind of a difficult, it's always kind of difficult to try to figure out how to get rigorous when it comes to looking at impacts. Here, what we've done is we, uh, we actually did it by um, an experimental design that compares four points in time. So we measure them at this sort of pre-pre-season when school first starts. Then we measure them again with the same survey instruments right before the league. Then we measure them immediately after the league. So there's a post-test. And then we wait a few months when school lets out and we measure them again. And the idea is that if you can see differences between pre and post around that league, the intervention, that are bigger than differences, you know, in the pre, in the before, the pre, pre to pre, and in the after, the post to post, post, what you can actually show is that the, you know, you have development, student development. And if you can actually see a 
bigger slope during that intervention, it's evidence, strong evidence that what you're seeing is not just maturation across time. Um, so we just gathered the data and I'm hoping we'll have results very soon. The analysis is pretty complicated. Um, but what we are looking at is really trying to get a much closer read about equity, not just in terms of um, income of schools, but also in terms of gender, ethnicity, ability, sexual orientation, all of these variables that um, really do matter when it comes to how you experience online games. So that's one area we're really dialing in. Another area we're really dialing in is trying to get into what are the specific program design elements that have the biggest impact. Because if we know which ones are having the big impacts, we know that coaches and GMs certainly are, are one of the big catalysts for change. But if we can start to dial in on what else matters, then we're able to sort of um, emulate our clubs after those variables that we know count. So for example, if we know, um, you know, that um, a certain number of roles are really crucial to outcomes, then we can actually tell all of our teachers and sites to build those in. So stay tuned. I'm hoping we'll have far more on that soon. Um, but more than that, I just want to sort of back up and talk a little bit about the metaphors we use when it comes to kids and interest and learning. And I, I kind of want to pan out some here. You know, um, working in games and learning this long, I can tell you that the most common metaphor we use when we think about interest and its role in learning is uh, is the chocolate covered broccoli metaphor. Um, you know, this, the idea here is that, you know, like for example, oh, you know, e scholastic esports, that's just chocolate covered broccoli, meaning all you've done is take, um, you know, sort of, I guess, pander to kids. And what you've done is basically take academic content, which is the broccoli and poured interest on top of it to make it interesting. And that's the chocolate. And the result of course, is something that most of us would never ever want to eat even though broccoli is delicious and chocolate's delicious, right? We use this metaphor all the time. The problem is that it is absolutely the most broken metaphor we can use. It's dead wrong. The right metaphor we ought to be using is in fact something more like this. Interest is not something that we add to content to make it interesting. You know, I there's a visual designer named Vermin who, who I was just reading the other day for a course that I teach who wrote, Learning is remembering what you are interested in. And when I, I read it, I paused for it and I thought, what is he saying? And then I realized he's saying the same thing I'm saying, that interest is actually the driving wheel, the engine of learning itself. Again and again and again, whether you're looking at games or manga or stamp collecting or sports, it's your interest in the topic that enables you to to succeed and stick with it even in the face of challenge. It's interest in the topic that is the driving wheel of how students are able to grapple with complicated work. It is not merely some sort of pandering chocolate on top of broccoli. In fact, I would say that um, without interest there, without knowing what you're doing and why you're doing it, learning becomes very disorganized and hard for it to actually stick and retain and stick with actually transforming the student and their identity and their relationship to school itself. So the reason that this, these kinds of esports um, programs matter are because they are vehicles for, I think when we do it right, for actually showing kids, proving that the things that they're interested in, even far from Long, you know, things, very distant transfer topics like esports, in fact, are absolutely connected to everything they're learning in classrooms and then some, right? And it's that relationship that I think, that understanding, I think, is, is what's so important and what ought to endure. And esports is a great vehicle because games are great for entertainment. They're great for entertainment, but they're also really incredible architectures for engagement. But games are not the only vehicle, right? These same findings, I would, I would conjecture, you would find very similar findings with other kinds of attempts to meet kids where they are, where they're already passionate, and actually enrich that space.
So I will get off my soapbox there. I will say as just a passing note, if you're interested in some of this work, I hope everyone will join us. My husband and I have run this conference called the Games Learning and Society Conference for, I don't know, 12, 15 years. And when we moved to California, we sort of set it aside and you know, took a pause from it, but it feels this summer we're going to start it up again. And I'm really excited because if there's one thing about the pandemic that I realized is that I deeply miss my community. I miss all of the educators, all of the designers, all of the parents and teachers and students. So we are we are picking up our community back again, and it's going to be on UCI campus, June 15th to 17th. Um, so if you're interested, you have my contact information. I hope everyone can join us. And I think I'll just stop there. I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'm certainly happy to field some if we do. Well, we can certainly uh, relay the questions through the chat if anyone has any questions. We have about uh, five more minutes. Yeah, Dr. Steinkuller, if you've got uh, a, a link to the conference or the info about the conference, um, we'd love to get that in the chat. Yes, I will stop my share so I can go pull one up for you. We did have several people ask if, if uh, there's a, a version of the slides that can be shared with the audience yes and i believe too um are we recording and posting else excellent yes. good so the whole talk will also be that's great thank you of course thanks for having me i feel like i just did so much talking <laughs> <laughs> I see some questions in the in the chat. What is the timeline from inception pitching? Uh, let's see this to our high school and middle school admin and a lot. What's a reasonable expectation? Hmm. Oh, that is a great question. And I'm going to do, I'm going to defer to experts who are actually on the ground with implementation because I feel like my answers will be grossly naive compared to their experience. Um, I know that NASAF changes its games and we've actually over pandemic learned to add in lots of different um, time scales of different activities so that it doesn't always have to be a two and a half a month week, that it can be a much shorter duration and also broadening the game titles. Um, one piece of advice I will give to anyone who's in this space is, um, you know, different games appeal to different audiences. So um, varying up the games that you choose is really important because um, if kids are into League of Legends, um, you know, they'll, they'll be in the club and want to do it when it's League of Legends, but then you lose kids that might, for example, be in like some of like the Smash Club. So one thing we found really valuable in terms of engaging lots of students is actually doing to swap out games, not be afraid of that. Um, I also see a really good question there around um, concerns about screen time and being in sedentary behavior. Yes, I completely have concerns about screen time and sedentary behavior. I will say as a starter, I think that our focus on quantity of screen time over quality of screen time has um, actually led us to some significant problems. Um, part of what we see now in youth behavior online, one of the biggest concerns is, um, well, is toxic behavior in online game spaces is probably a number one concern right now. Um, and in that space, I think that as speaking as a parent, um, I think that we've been so messaged to think about the amount of time that our kids spend on screen and to, especially when they're teens, not really know as much about what they're playing, who they're playing with, and what they're doing when they're online. Um, I think that, you know, as they become teenagers, we tend to take more of a backseat toward that. Um, but that focus on quantity becomes a real problem for us because, um, especially right now, when kids are um, engaged or on the on the receiving, giving, or bystander end of behaviors online that are just simply not humane, not democratic, not within a keeping of what I think are our shared values in America. And I think that that has been a big um, 
red herring and I think we need to address it. But this concern around sedentary lifestyles, I think is a real one. Um, you know, in esports on competitive teams like our, our college campus, um, you know, they actually have professional trainers and they have to do uh, quite extensive workouts because it turns out that esports is actually quite physically demanding. So they're expected to sleep well, eat well, and they have a physical therapist and they have workout regimens. I don't know to what extent that's true in the high school spaces. I just, I, I'm completely ignorant about that. But I do think there's reason to be concerned about how much all of us are spending on screens. So for example, in our household, we have rules that, you know, I actually, one of my kids has a little um, alarm on his desktop that says every 15 minutes, I need him to get up and go move around, right? So not just not just the length of time overall, but just that long duration of sitting isn't good for our bodies. And I think it's one we really need to make sure that we are um, staying on top of because screens are not going to go away. Um, you know, figuring out how to do this in a way that is healthy for our bodies and our minds is going to be really, really important. Thank you for that. There's a question about the uh, first person shooters there and in college and and maybe in, in Riverside. But let's uh, I, I wonder what your, you know, your perspective is on college first person shooters. Yeah, I mean, I think at the college level, you know, many first person shooters are not intended for a youth audience. So I would say first stop check ESRB ratings. Um, you know, there are first person shooters or games like say Valorant that do a little bit more magic that I do not find to be like in my household on our family values are allowed. And then there are other games that are simply outside the bounds and they can play them after they're 18 and off of out of my home and they can make their own decisions, right? Um, I also play first person shooters. So um, I also think that they're incredibly artistic. Call of Duty World War II is probably one of the best games I've ever played. I laughed, I cried, I screamed, I threw a controller, but only once and I swear the door was, uh, was closed. My kids did not see me behaving that way. But yes, I think that, you know, I think that we have to be mindful about what's school appropriate, right? It's one thing, even if parents allow it in their homes, that's, that's, that's in the purview of families. I think that schools have to be careful about um, what games they choose because in some ways they're sanctioning it. And in some cases, maybe a first person shooter, a specific first person shooter might be appropriate. Um, but you know, in others, it's simply not. I think that there's a lot of discretion that has to happen around game choices. That's a great question, by the way. And it's so, um, it, you know, how do I put this? Um, it's difficult to make those decisions in the abstract, right? They're often come down to what's right for one kid may not at all be okay for another kid. Um, no, I appreciate that. And I, I think um, what we also tell people, if, if you're starting a, an esports program uh, in your district or in your school, or you're thinking about uh, adding a different game, that's an issue that can torpedo a, a, a project, right? So bring your stakeholders in, you, you know, talk to staff, talk to parents, talk to students, and make sure that everyone's, uh, talk to the board, right? Make sure that everyone's uh, on board with your, with those choices ahead of rolling it out. Yes, what a great piece of advice. You know, 15, 20 years ago, even in Sweden, they, kids played counter-strike on team squads and esports without any, and no one ever batted an eye. When I did a a small stay there, I was like, how can this not be controversial? And then I realized it's because in Sweden, they don't have gun violence problems and we do. So, um, you know, I can say that as far as the evidence base goes, the argument, the evidence for a relationship of any, of any meaningful amount between violent video games and gun violence is, is non-existent, non-existent. Um, and, I know that literature really very well, but that does not mean that choosing a first person shooter is appropriate for schools necessarily or for certain households because games carry values in them. So, you know, rather than, you know, I guess I would just say, rather than thinking about violent video games causing violence, um, I would say we should think about the actual things that cause violence. Uh, we know them, we've known them for 30 years. We just don't always have political will to address them. But in terms of games, you know, thinking in terms of what is the messaging, I would argue, um, you know, also looking at representations of gender and race. 
um, is really, I think it, you have to be very thoughtful about um, what games deserve to be um, introduced at your school, right? Um, school set culture and they ought to set where the bar is at. Um, and not all games are, are um, not all games have earned, have earned it to be sanctioned by schools. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I just really quickly, we have, our next session starts at 3.15, but uh, we might have a, a couple of minutes here just to address this question if you have any insight on it, because we get this question a lot as well in terms of NASEF and uh, the lower grades, uh, K through eight environment. Um, um, do you have any insight on, on what NASEF is doing in, in that respect? None, I have no insight. Um, I will say, you know, it gets really, um, it gets more complicated once you move below age 13 yeah. because so many league games um, just the complete, you know, you can't really land party them. They need to be online. And then it's a whole nother conversation, right? So I think that it gets dicier once you get below middle school typically. Um, but I do know that there are inroads into that space. And I do know that there are, you know, there's some fun ways to engage kids in games. You know, Minecraft is an obvious example. And Minecraft has lots of collaborative and competitive um, activities within it. So I know that there has been some effort to sort of think about that. I do think that games-based school sort of overseen and sanctioned and enriched programs are a valuable one, but whether or not their esports is a little bit different only because typically that demands the online component. Um, and typically you wanna regulate that pretty extensively with youngers. It's a great question though. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we we are just about out of time here. Um, I know that you had mentioned some of the insights that practitioners can give. And I think this next uh, set of uh, sessions that we have, the, the sessions for the next three hours really deal with uh, the perspective of of practitioners. And so you want to hear from people who are actually in that space and who are, are doing this work for kids. Um, this is an opportunity. So our next session uh, does start at uh, 315. I'm going to go ahead and put that up there. And uh, again, from that SCED at bit.ly, ES21, ES21 SCED, you can get back to the SCED. And again, um, I so appreciate uh, what you shared with us, Dr. Stein Cooler. Um, you know, I, I talked about uh, you know what resonated with me when you when when I heard you speak before, and it was the the simple fact, of course, that you know what kids worked harder at at the vocabulary when they were in that game context, and yeah, duh, yeah. you know, <laughs> it was just great. It was it was, it was something that stuck with me and kind of dr drives my perspective on education about motivation. And, um, and, and now you talk about interest, you know, being the engine for learning and I, I just, or the steering wheel for learning or the steering system for learning. And I, I really appreciate that metaphor as well. So I hope that everyone was able to take from this something that they can carry into uh, their esports, their schools, their, their, uh, their programs and really um, move this forward. So again, we wanna thank you for um, really all that you do in this work and, and uh, I'm a, I, I follow closely a lot of the work that you do. And um, I think as far as our league, we try to incorporate many of the ideas that you espouse. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Steve, I, I was expecting you to play some Beyonce there at the, at the end. <laughs> but yeah, thank you, Dr. Stein uh, We'll We'll see all of you in, uh, in the breakout sessions. Thank you. Right, take care.